Thank you, Robin. You know, when uh, time this morning uh, told me I'd be following that, I was in trouble. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things today. The first thing is uh, the PGA Regional Model, which is a new model that's coming out uh, later this fall. Um, this model was developed to add additional support to career services, player development, recruitment, and section operations. Uh, the goal is to have more of a uh, local uh, grassroots approach to uh, helping our sections uh, and to create greater uh, collaboration. Because right now how it works is to take player development, for example, Junko, she really works in asylum. She works for someone in Florida, opposed to someone regionally here in the West Coast. So the model is to take the current teams that we have and align them in seven defined regions, which are up here. We're going to be in the far right side on this model, the west model. We're going to be with uh, our District 11, which is Southern Cal, Northern Cal, Aloha, and District 14, which includes the southwest section, which Don Ray is a member of, as well as the Pacific Northwest. Um, the goal is to expand it over time, as you can see down in the floor boxes, uh, to add accounting and finance, sales and business development, legal, and then HR. And I'm excited about the HR part, particularly with our uh, lovely state of uh, California, Mr. Kessler, that uh, to try and make sure that our sections follow the right rules and do that uh, moving forward. Um, the board and the PGA is committed to this. Uh, we've already earmarked another million dollars for next year in 2023 to put towards this to continue to grow this program. So please look for this uh, to uh, be launched in the fall. It'll be very exciting. I think it'll also uh, add more interaction between all the members and the team, uh, field team that we currently have. So that's our new model. Please keep an eye out for that moving forward. Go to the next slide, please. So Robin asked me to make this more uh, no reports, more informational. So he asked about to uh, bring up about what's the trade changes and trends uh, in our business. And I've done this before, probably four or five other times. Scott and I've talked about it uh, before COVID, and always uh, I had to give a doom and gloom uh, presentation. But I'm proud to say that uh, things have definitely changed since COVID. So let's start with uh, this slide here. This talks about rounds, and as you can see here. We did 518 million rounds in the U.S. last year, which is a growth of 25 million rounds. Um, since 2000 to 2021, the first 18 years, we lost 91 million rounds. But the really cool thing is, we made all 91 million rounds up in the last three years. So we're back to the dates we were in 2000. Um, next slide, please. This talks about um, golfers and the changing golfers. Uh, Alison talking about having more of a female presence. This is a great slide to represent that. The three circles are the highlighted ones. You can see that female golfers grew by 6.5%, which is more than double uh, that of male golfers uh, in the last year. Uh, also, higher incomes grew by 5.4%, which is more than double uh, lesser incomes. But the big one that drove the bus was seniors 65 and older, grew by 17.4%. So what this tells us is, it's a great thing, but as Robin says, to maintain this, we're going to have to make sure that we backfill those boomers because as the boomers go away, we've got to make sure that we've got new golfers coming in and we're backfilling the ages 50, 55 to 64 in particular to make sure we can drive them and keep them in, in the golf, uh, golf business. I'm playing golf. Next slide, this talks about uh, the golf course supply chain. So this is tracked by Palooza as well. And what this is, the net number of new golf courses were built minus the golf courses that were shut down. So last year, the U.S. lost 93, uh, I'm sorry, 72 golf courses. Interesting part, 15 straight years in a row, there's been a net loss of golf courses. And over the last uh, 20 years or so, we've had lost 11% of the golf courses in the U.S., so since 2000. So it's kind of interesting, it's the trend. It's sad to see the golf courses go away, but it does, when we lose golf courses, it makes our, our properties more uh, profitable. This uh, is a stat that talks about what's happened to golf since uh, COVID uh, broke and everybody went back to playing golf again. So it's a two-year analysis. The really neat thing is you look at golf revenue. Golf revenue is up in two years by almost 29%. Golf rounds are up by 21%. And tee sheet utilization is up by 9.6%. So almost 10% more golfers are playing on the golf courses and uh, teeing it up in your part of your properties. So this is very encouraging. Again, if we can keep this trend or even maintain this, we're going to be in a good place. Bryce, let me skip this slide. Next one. So this is a power email address. This is something that they put together that I thought was very interesting, some stats. 
on what can we do to make sure that we continue to keep this trend going and grow the game. A couple of things stood out to me. Number one, that uh, new customers spend double the spending of lost customers in 20. So if you got a new customer, you had their email address, you're going to get twice as much money from that person playing golf. The other stat I noticed that retained customer spending for those with email addresses was 50% higher than your average customer. So what that tells us is all, if you can get their email address for a new customer and you engage them, keep engaging them in the marketplace, they're going to spend 50% more than someone you do not have an email address of. So what that tells me is capture as much data as you can and keep engaging them over and over again and your course will be successful as well as our game. So I think those are the keys to success for that. Um, so that concludes that part of the report. The one thing I'm going to just mention is um, I'm going to talk about Pat for one minute here. Um, the last time I, I saw Pat was at our annual meeting last, last December, and he wanted to pull me aside. There was a topic about Bell Hollow that he knew about. He pulled me aside, we started talking about it. And he's 87 years old, he's telling me we're, we're debating different opinion on which way to go. He's really smacking me in the chest, like, we gotta do this. We got his passion was just contagious. And I um, love him very much. He's a great mentor. And I want to thank Sue and the Bradley family for sharing him with us because, uh, because of him, our association and our membership is always going to be better for it. So thank you very much.